but God. Have you ever wanted to share with someone about your relationship with Jesus or about how they might have a relationship with Jesus and you just felt stuck? Have you ever been hesitant in sharing your faith because you felt ill prepared to do so? I have. If that's ever been you, I want to tell you exactly where you can go to find help. If you ever want to know where to go in Scripture to get a clear picture of the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there's really no better or clearer picture than you will find at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. It's here that Paul in 10 short verses lays out for us exactly what happens to a man or a woman or a child who is born again. He tells us what happens and who is in charge about bringing new life. He does it quite systematically as well. He gives us first of all a clear picture of what our lives looked like before Jesus Christ. He gives us a clear picture of the intervention. And then he gives us a clear picture of our new life in Christ. So let's dive into Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. The first three verses tell us what our lives were like before. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. I was dead. And there was not a thing that any of us could do about it. Dead things don't come to life on their own. The thing that killed us was our sin. So let's start there. What is sin? Billy Graham was once asked that question and he gave the following answer. A sin is any thought or action that falls short of God's will. God is perfect and anything that we do that falls short of his perfection is sin. I believe that to be true, but I believe it goes even deeper than that. In Romans 1, we read this. Paul writes, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. I believe, and I guess it's arguable, but I believe that the root of all sin is that we want to be God. We want to be the rulers of our life. We want to do what seems right to us. We want to be in charge. We want to be at the top of the mountain and we live our lives trying to get there. We exchange the glory of God for our own glory. What a pitiful exchange that is. We want to be God. God has never had a competitor. As foolish as it may seem, all of our attempts are in vain. We cannot in any way or in any form take on the attributes of God, and yet we continue to try. Now if I ask you if you thought that you could be God, you would laugh at me. And we would all quickly recognize how ridiculous that question is. And yet it never slows us down from trying. Our every attempt contributes to our separation from Him. That's what happened in the garden. God said to Adam, I've placed you here in this garden of perfection. Hear me right. This garden of perfection. After forming Eve as a wife, 
They had everything in that garden available to them that they could ever, ever want. And on top of that, they had a perfect relationship with a holy God. But God said, there's, there's only one thing, as wonderful as this place is, as beautiful as our relationship with each other is, there's only one thing that you can't do. One thing I forbid you to do. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but in Genesis 2 he says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. One little thing. One little thing. Well, you know the rest of the story. The enemy lied to him. He said that what God had said was not true. And so they ate from the forbidden tree and sin entered the world. Sin began with a lie and we've been lying to ourselves ever since. Adam and Eve challenged God to be God. Back in Romans 1, Paul writes, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. When we exchange the truth of God for a lie, and our worship goes to anything but God, then we are separated from God. So now we go back to Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Paul, doesn't Paul do an incredible job of telling us what the problem was? We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We wanted to be God. We want to be God. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like most of mankind? No. Like the rest of mankind. Since Adam and Eve We've all been born in sin. We followed the course of this world. We followed the prince of the air and we lived by the passions of the flesh. There used to be a show that I would watch from time to time because I'm weird like this uh, called Intervention. See, I can tell who's seen that by the look on your face. Okay, a few of you. Intervention was a show where a family member has a serious drug addiction and the rest of the family gets together and says we, we need to intercede, we need to do something about this drug addiction. And so they would get together, they all knew what was going on except for the drug addict. But they confronted them with their sin. Paul says that's what God did for us. See, their motivation was love. They wanted to help. So in this next section, we see that God held an intervention for us. The beginning of verse 4. But God... All this horrible stuff in our lives, all this competition, all this desire to be God 
And then verse 4 says, But God, there are no two more significant words in all of Scripture. If someone asked me what all Scripture hinges upon, I would take them to Ephesians 2, 4 and read them the first two words, But God. God did something that we could not do for ourselves. We were dead. And God changed all that. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. The only one who could did. Our God is rich in mercy. Our God has a great love for us. And even when we were dead, unable to bring any life to ourselves, God made us alive together with Christ. And just when you think that maybe God saw something in us that made us deserving, Paul says, and it is by grace that you have been saved. Not only have I done it, but I did it without you. I did it without you because of my rich mercy and my everlasting love for you. You didn't earn it. You didn't contribute to it. You didn't do something along the way that tipped the scales in your favor. The grace of God came to bear on your life and on mine. And in that moment, our sin was forgiven and we were set free. Thanks be to God. And then with our eternity sealed, Paul says, and he didn't just stop there. I mean, that would have been a wonderful gift, wouldn't it? I mean, that would have been, I would have been very pleased with that. But Paul goes on. He raised us up with him and seated us with him. What the heck is that about? Why in the world do I deserve a seat in heaven with him? Well, the truth is I don't deserve it. But I got one anyway seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Our forever with God simply awaits our arrival. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said it this way, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is writ written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? See, those in Christ cannot be stung by physical death. Death is swallowed up. I, 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 I picture a, a giant fish just engulfing. Just Death is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin. There's that word again. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Him that does it. It's Him that does it all. 
And then Paul says, and once he does it, your life will never be the same. In verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Paul wants to make that clear, doesn't he? He says it several different times in several different ways. This is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works. Because if it was, then you could boast about it. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What Paul wants us to see is that this wonderful gift that we have been given, that we didn't work for, calls us to make a difference with our lives. The life that we are given is not just for us to hoard and to possess. It is for us to give away. Before we ever lived one day as a new creation, Paul says, God prepared for us a life of good works. And his call on our lives this morning is to walk in them. Trust God to live his life through us. The biggest challenge that all of us face every day of our lives is battling the temptation to reestablish ourselves on a throne that is not ours. It's God's. If you want to know peace, if you want to know hope, if you want a life with purpose, then get out of the way. Stay out of the way. In preparing this week, I found this prayer. And in closing, I want to pray it. If you just bow your head and close your eyes. Dear God, we confess our need for you today. We need your healing and your grace. We need hope restored. We need to be reminded that you work on behalf of those you love constantly, powerfully, completely. Forgive us for trying to fix our situations all on our own. Forgive us for running all different directions and spinning our wills to find help when true help and healing must be found in you. Forgive us for forgetting how much we need you above everyone and everything else. We come to you and bring you the places we are hurting. You see where no one else is able to fully see or understand. You know the pain we've carried, the burdens, the cares. You know where we need to be set free. We ask for your healing and grace to cover every broken place, every wound, every heartache. Thank you that you are able to do far more than we could ever imagine. Thank you for your mighty power that acts on behalf of your children. On our behalf, we reach out to you and know that you are restoring and redeeming every place of difficulty, every battle for your greater glory. Thank you that you will never waste our pain and suffering. We release to you this day every need and problem that we've carried or tried hard to control. We believe in your goodness to see us through. We love you. We need you today. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.